Today's anomaly introduces Mrs. Leona Helmsley, best known as America's Queen of Mean. She was one of New York's most cutthroat tyrants, gaining a reputation as a boss who is hard to work for, to put it mildly. Yet she didn't come from much. No, Mrs. Helmsley's climb to the top was indeed remarkable for a woman of the 1970s. This was in part because of the muddied history she created for herself, making it difficult to unravel just how she became so powerful. So, to figure out Mrs. Helmsley, we must take a deep dive into her unassuming beginnings. Leona Mindy Rosenthal was born on July 4, 1920 to Polish immigrants Ida and Morris Rosenthal. Though originally settled in the New York countryside, the family moved to Manhattan to be closer to Morris's hat-making business. Leona's mother, although from the lower class herself, taught her daughters all the graces of women from high society for the time. Even in light of this, Leona frequently clashed with her mother and sisters, often accusing them of being tyrants. In her youth, Leona was known by her teachers as an excellent English student who was highly skilled with communication. But she found herself bored and couldn't stand the path laid out for her. Dropping out of high school at 16, Leona changed her first and last name a number of times before settling on Leona Roberts. This marked the beginning of how Leona would constantly reinvent herself What's certain is she had no intention of settling for the modest life that seemed to await her. It's unclear what Leona did with herself over the next few years. She says she attended New York's Hunter College for a while, but there's no record to prove this. Throughout her life, Leona was known for her fondness of cigarettes, chain smoking multiple packs a day at her peak. Fittingly, she said that she was the model for Chesterfield cigarettes in her youth, but this also remains unproven. One thing was certain though, Leona planned to marry Rich. At the age of 18, she married 28-year-old Leo E. Panzurer. Mr. Panzurer was a lawyer, and together the couple had two children. By the end of the 1940s, they were divorced. Finding work as a secretary, she had an off-and-on relationship with her wealthy boss which resulted in marriage, divorce, marriage again, and finally divorce again. She totally denied this relationship in later years. It was now 1962, and Leona had to start from scratch. Not an easy prospect back then for a 42-year-old single mother. She wasn't at all humbled by her experiences though, and despite feeling entitled to her previous well-to-do lifestyle, she acknowledged she would have to start small. And from here, she began to plot. Leona managed to find more work as a secretary for a real estate firm. When management changed hands, she was able to persuade the board to give her a shot at brokerage. This is where Leona Roberts began her meteoric rise back to the top. No one could ever say Leona Roberts was lazy. Her early associates were called a hard-working woman with a good sense of humor, but a growing temper, too. Still, this didn't really show up too much early on. A talented real estate agent, Leona knew how to work her clients to her favor. Perhaps recalling what her mother taught her, she was especially great with selling high-end condos. Before long, she was vice president of the company, saying she collected six figures a year. Whether her wealth was exaggerated or not, Leona was established as a dominant force in New York real estate by the end of the 1960s. Harry Helmsley was the major commercial broker of New York, managing amongst other properties the Empire State Building. He had gotten a taste of residential sales though and looked to expand his growing operation. Around the same time, Leona decided to get work with Mr. Helmsley's company to advance her own career. She had her sights set on him, with the fact that he was married being of no consequence. Given Leona's reputation, her presence was expected at the Realty Foundation of New York's annual dinner. For Leona Roberts, every social function was an opportunity. And as the Orlando Sentinel wrote, this would be her biggest catch to date. Apparently Mr. Helmsley attended the dinner without his wife because she didn't like rubbing elbows with the other tycoons as he did. Mr. Helmsley loved dancing and Leona quickly caught on to this. Questioning his associates, she quickly caught up to the real estate mogul and they danced the night away. Of course, Leona told a different story years later claiming it was Mr. Helmsley who sought her out because of her business acumen. Most publications don't find this credible, especially given Leona's tendency to rewrite her past. The idea that Leona Roberts was headhunted seems unlikely, 
especially for the $500,000 salary she touted. But in the end, she not only got a job with Mr. Helmsley, he eventually did make her his senior vice president. By 1971, Leona Roberts was living in a penthouse in downtown Manhattan. She courted Mr. Helmsley privately over a year and a half. His wife, being a bit of a homebody, didn't suspect a thing. Leona Roberts buttered up Mr. Helmsley with compliments and constant affection. In later years, his aides attribute his lack of experience with women, despite being married, to how Leona could snatch him up. She could tell that such an adolescent approach to giving him attention might work. And she was right. Given Mr. Helmsley's penchant for a most simple lifestyle, it was a classic case of opposites attract. Leona dazzled him with elaborate displays, enough to finally end his marriage of 34 years. Through this, Mr. Helmsley had apparently believed there was another wealthy man in competition for Leona's hand. He proceeded with the divorce anyways. Leona didn't waste time snagging her prize. And there was good reason. She was drawing the ire of her tenants who were sick of her shady business practices. Just before marrying Harry, Leona lost her real estate license in a lawsuit filed against her. But with Harry by her side, Leona Helmsley had little to fear. Her ostentatiousness only grew with the wealth her husband held. She knew how to keep Mr. Helmsley happy, even throwing an I'm just wild about Harry party for him annually complete with caviar and fine wines. Mrs. Helmsley bragged, often to the point of exaggeration, about personal details of the relationship with her rich friends. The couple bought up properties across America, including one in Florida that they frequently visited. This property would soon become the scene of the most frightening experience of the Helmsleys' lives. There was a stabbing at the Florida condo in 1973, but most details are lost to time. Leona described the would-be assassin as a woman wearing a World War gas mask, but others, including her own family members, had their doubts. Some believe it was a domestic dispute, but whatever happened clearly shook them. They refused to appear in public without bodyguards from that point on, and it was enough to recall Mrs. Helmsley's estranged son Jay to his mother's side. The reconciliation landed him a job in the Helmsley companies, but it seemed even blood ties couldn't save one from the wrath of Mrs. Helmsley. As her sisters died over the years, Leona bore enough of a grudge from growing up she refused to go to their funerals. She did seem fond of her brother Alvin, however, getting him a job in the Helmsley hotel business. When Mrs. Helmsley's son Jay died from a sudden heart attack in 1982, she immediately served his widow Mimi and their child with an eviction notice. Mrs. Helmsley also sued her dead son's estate, citing unpaid loans he had taken from her. The courts ruled in her favor to the tune of over $100,000. What's more is that Leona Helmsley was having a noticeable effect on her previously meek husband, whose increasingly calculated business decisions began to annoy his residents. His reputation was soiled by the many battles he found himself in with tenants, who the media often sided with. This essentially pushed Mr. Helmsley out of residential properties towards his budding hotel empire, headed by Leona. In the late 1970s, he began funding construction on his dream project, the Helmsley Palace Hotel on Madison Avenue. It opened in 1981. Mr. Helmsley touted that he had constructed the finest hotel in the city and had certainly charged the rates to match. But he wasn't wrong about it being spectacular. He tasked Leona with running the day-to-day -day operations, something her fine tastes would be tailored for if not for her explosive personality. Though she presented herself as a perfectionist offering the ultimate luxuries, Mrs. Helmsley's house and hotel staff saw this as a front for how she acted, particularly in front of guests. Michael Moss describes one such incident at a Helmsley Hotel dining room. An older woman had ordered a very specific kind of low-calorie tuna sandwich for her and her associate. With the first bite, she was decidedly unsatisfied and let out such a barrage of curse words that the other guests asked the staff how such a vulgar personality could be let into Mrs. Helmsley's opulent hotel. The staff told them that the woman making the scene was Leona Helmsley herself. From that point on, the waiter strategically placed her far away from any other guests whenever she dined at her own restaurant, and this was hardly an isolated incident. Employees were count a boss who would fire workers on a whim if she thought they did anything to sully the business. And interestingly, good work was complimented just as fast. This fiery personality made her hated by not only her own workers, 
but those who had to deal with her in other business capacities. Staff constantly warned each other if Leona was around. A termination was usually followed with swear words all the way out the door by Leona Helmsley. But the reputation of the hotelier was, for the time, the least of her concerns. Financial trouble was beginning to threaten the entire Helmsley Empire. By 1983, the Helmsley Palace Hotel's budget ballooned $20 million over initial projections. Private investigators were hired by Mr. Helmsley's investors to determine what the heck was going on. The conclusion was a lengthy paper trail of invoices and other charges that didn't line up with the needs of the Palace Hotel. Labor was often contracted out to other Helmsley subsidiaries at exorbitant costs. Even personal items like a white and pink satin dress for Leona were on record, billed as employee uniforms. Obviously, the couple was cooking the books. That same year, they purchased Dunnellan Hall, a weekending sanctuary in Connecticut. Mrs. Helmsley immediately went to work ordering renovations and extravagant additions. Her decor noticeably didn't include books. Apparently, Leona wasn't fond of reading, saying of newspapers, quote, Who has time? The expansions to the property quickly hit several millions of dollars. The couple was reluctant to pay this out of their own pocket, so they deployed a new tactic. Rather than honor the contracts with the laborers, they tried to stiff them by complaining the work they did was unsatisfactory. Some contractors filed out of court, but others were so enraged they took matters further with a campaign to expose the Helmsleys. Because the invoices for their private residence were often billed to their businesses, there was substantial evidence of tax evasion and fraud. This was mailed to the New York Post in 1985, who ran an article divulging the lengthy list of purported crimes. If convicted, the maximum sentence could see both of them behind bars for the rest of their lives. Three years after the article, the couple was indicted on dozens of fraud charges in a sensational trial. They pled not guilty, and used their wealth to have their lawyers file motion after motion, thus giving them time to build a solid defense. This stalling proved helpful. When the case did resume, it took an unexpected turn. The 79-year-old Harry Helmsley was able to evade trial because of his failing health, which made him totally unfit. But although he escaped justice, this meant Leona Helmsley would be increasingly isolated when it came her turn. In April of 1989, Leona's most hated rival Donald Trump wrote her a letter that the Washington Post said showed his, quote, previously hidden capacity for venom. Ironically, he attacked Mrs. Helmsley most harshly for her habit of firing employees that crossed her. These kinds of feuds were common amongst haughty real estate personalities of the 1980s, and Mr. Trump was especially aggressive because he had spent years in the Helmsley's shadow. June 26, 1989 was Mrs. Helmsley's first court date. The jury was shuffled throughout the highly publicized trial, and the prosecutors charged that she had illegally billed over $4 million to her business to avoid paying a quarter of that in tax. Much of this was because of the renovations at Dunnellan Hall. The defense tried arguing that the couple had no intent of wrongdoing. Mrs. Helmsley's claims of poor workmanship were cited as a reason why the invoices remain unpaid, though the lawyers also argued that they were billed to the other Helmsley properties owned by the couple so as to avoid Leona's discerning eye. This legal team included the likes of Alan Dershowitz, top profile for the time. Salacious details were laid out before the jury about each and every shady dealing undertaken by the Helmsleys. One of the witnesses, housekeeper Elizabeth Baum, was the source of that infamous quote supposedly said by Leona. Quote, We don't pay taxes. Only the little people pay taxes. It summed up everything most people knew about Mrs. Helmsley in two pithy lines. Naturally, it failed to endear to the most important audience of all, her jury. It took six days for the jury to deliver their verdict. Guilty. Leona Helmsley was sentenced to 16 years in prison. Of course, you didn't expect she would serve all that time, did you? Mrs. Helmsley appealed and wound up spending only a year and a half in jail. Her equally publicized and much disdained release saw her try to sweep the affair under the rug. I saw one cover. Greedy, 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 that's nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. How dare they call me greedy, greedy, greedy. I tell you who's greedy. Are the politicians? 
they're greedy for power and whatever else they get. It's, I'm not greedy. As usual, Mrs. Helmsley just wanted to get back to her work. Yet she found herself with few friends aside from an elderly husband who was losing his faculties. Those who remained at her side included Panama dictator Manuel Noriega, controversial first lady of the Philippines Imelda Marcos, and the Hilton family. What's more is that the Helmsley Palace Hotel had been sold to the royal family of Brunei, marking the end of her reign as the building's queen of mean. Harry Helmsley died in 1997. The inheritance made Leona one of America's richest women for the time, but this was bittersweet. With her husband gone, she could not retain control of New York hotels given her criminal record. As the years went on, Leona Helmsley became more and more withdrawn from the public eye. Cloistering herself in her penthouse apartment, she didn't get very many visitors. To rehabilitate her image, she made a considerable number of donations over her final years, including $5 million to New York firefighters in the wake of 9-11. In truth, Mrs. Helmsley had always been philanthropic even at the peak of her wickedness. Whether this was for show, tax write-offs, or out of genuine concern is unknown. After all, her deceased husband was known for high-profile donations to gain publicity. But it is undeniable she gave millions to causes ranging from animal welfare to Hurricane Katrina relief. Leona Helmsley died of heart failure at the age of 87. One of her final and most infamous acts was leaving $12 million to her dog Trouble. This amount was reduced to $2 million as it was considered an absurd amount made while Leona was in a failing state of mind. The dog lived with the general manager of the Helmsley Sandcastle Hotel, with a budget drawn up to account for food, grooming, and security. Though this last point may seem odd, the dog did get a number of death threats over the years. The rest of the considerable inheritance was either put into trust or left to two of Mrs. Helmsley's grandchildren, as long as they visited her son Jay's grave every year. The others were written out of the will, though upon appeal they were awarded some of the dog's money under a gag order. In the end, Leona is rarely remembered for the piles of money she donated, but rather for her outrageous shows of power which left a sour taste with most who knew her. How much of this was a character she created, and how much was Leona's personality isn't clear. Still, there are many more Leona Helmsleys out there which some of us choose to idolize in spite of their overbearing faults. The question becomes whether Leona's enablers share any responsibility for who she became. This is something we should all keep in mind when choosing who we give our attention to.